Speaker Petto. I am the Dean at the London Institute of Banking and Finance. And today uh, it's with great pleasure that I welcome three uh, colleagues. First one, Dr. Peter Hahn, uh, formerly the Dean and Harry Grunfeld Professor at the London Institute of Banking and Finance. Hi, Pete. Hello. Okay, second one, John Hearn is a visiting professor at LIBF. Hi, John. Hello, Maria. And uh, finally, Dr. Andrew Hilton is a visiting professor at LIBF and is also the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation, CSFI. Hi, Andrew. Hi. Okay, so I have a few questions. And so I'll start the first one. Uh, what forces are likely to shape world economic growth over the next decade? And uh, I'll start with Pete. Hi, Maria. What forces? Well, obviously, it's going to depend in the short term on how the virus turns out and the effects of the virus. But there were a number of things happening. We were in a slowing economy, uh, Brexit, the UK, election year in the US, so many, many things, uh, uh, Chinese global policy policies. But if I were to break it down, I think at the moment uh, where we are, um, there's a lot of talk about whether we have a V or a U or various letters V, you know, how, where the economy will go. And I, I perceive it as actually it's the C, the letter C. And essentially we're right in the middle of the C right now. And uh, it's almost a, a burden on everyone to see whether you're on the top part of the C and going up or you're in the middle of the C and you're gonna be going down until things change. And what I mean by that is there are people who found themselves to be able to engage electronically as we're doing now, uh, who are still getting paid saving money, uh, will purchase, will have purchasing power and do all kinds of interesting things. And then there are those people who are really suffering, whose um, economic, personal economic situations are going to be declining for some time. And so I think when we look at what issues will be important to those two groups, you kind of see how some of the things to the economy. So one of the ones that is clearly, um, we've been discussing more and more I would call them deglobalization issues, uh, bringing things back, onshoring, less trade, less dependence on certain countries who produce more things than that. how far that will go, which countries, certainly those people who've put it this way are in the upper side of my sea, uh, will resist those things because they benefit and they get cheaper products and all those things. Whereas those people on the bottom of the sea who may perceive some of those things as affecting their their economic livelihood and will resist it. So, you know, where does sustainability, we've been on the sustainability discussion for a number of years now. Uh, certainly, if you can afford sustainability you're there, uh, those people whose lifestyles uh, might be threatened might be less accommodative to sustainability. So, you know, those are, uh, you know, things that will affect us. I think those deglobalization, um, sustainability, you know, what, what will be in a overall lower growth economy, the demand for carbon products and stuff. So it allows certain transitions. So those factors uh, I think will be the, you know, the biggest influence is how perhaps we see the reemployment of those people at the bottom of the sea coming in uh, over a very long time, if you want to talk about it, certainly population trends will be the big driver. So I'll, I'll stop there and let you pass it on. Okay, so John, over to you. Right, I, um, I'd like to pick up obviously where Peter has left because uh, he's covered the immediate term and what might be the effect. Whereas my concern is with economic growth uh, in the world over the next decade, and I'm going to ignore the pandemic, I'm going to assume that's all over, I know it won't be, but I'm going to assume it is, and just concentrate on what I actually think is important for world economic growth. Uh, economics is a tough subject, which does always mean that economists are quite clever people, and quite clever people always want to intervene, uh, because they think they can do things better, and intervention has got to really take place uh, through uh, government and here I have to be controversial because uh, my observations over the years are that government spending is always wasteful uh, and it's motivated by votes, not a, an efficient allocation of resources. 
Economic growth, as far as I'm concerned, as an economist, is the most important thing because it does bring about a rise in living standards for everybody. Uh, and uh, it does, uh, strangely enough, it brings about more equality in society, the faster the rate of economic growth. So I would want to look at the actual sources of economic growth. And if we look just back over history, the sources of economic growth are quite clear. It's just invention and innovation. It's uh, new ideas and bringing those new ideas to the, the market, doing things differently, doing things better, allocating resources more efficiently. So can we release those resources? Now, in order to release those resources, in my view, you've got to have limited government. You've got to have balanced budgets. You've got to have central banks that don't interfere with prices so they don't interfere with interest rates. You've got to have uh, profits uh, giving incentives to people to become millionaires and billionaires and make us all better off by satisfying what uh, the customer wants. So it's those forces that we really need to release and therefore the question almost goes in reverse. Do we expect in the next year, 10 years, to see governments with uh, less input into an economy? Do we see them accepting balanced budgets, uh, not interfering with prices? I think the answer to all of that is no. So I suspect that the next decade is going to be uh, no and very low growth rather than actually releasing those, those forces that could get the, the world uh, uh, to accelerate its growth rate. Over to you, Andrew. Yes, Andrew. <laughs> well, I am um, at the disadvantage of actually having read the question. And the question is, what forces will shape the world economic growth over the next decade? Forces. Well, the obvious answer, and I assume that both of you, Pete, and you, John, would have mentioned it, is technology. Technology has driven economic growth for a while. There are all sorts of exciting technologies coming down the pike in nanotechnology, in the, the, the area of sustainability and so on and so forth. So I assumed that that was what you were going to say because that's the obvious answer to the question. So I was going to say something different. It won't be technology, it will be nationalism. And nationalism is rampant in Europe, particularly in Eastern Europe, but there's also a kind of nationalist fervor about being European and that is driving Europe at the present time and it is driving it in a protectionist direction. It's also driving China. China is obviously the growing power at the present time and it is driven not by communism, not by some desire for e e egalitarianism, it's, it's driven simply by Han nationalism and Han nationalism is going to be a major force throughout Asia. It's also obviously true in the United States where nationalism has probably never been as strong as it is at the present time. So I think nationalism is going to be a key driver, uh, perhaps second to technology, perhaps even technology comes second to it. Other than that, what are the forces that have always driven the global economy? Well, greed, um, look at the results of the, the big banks for the second quarter. They put, put aside lots of money for non-performing loans, but what really made money for the banks was their trading. Uh, bond trading has never been as profitable. The rich are getting richer and the poor as always go to the wall. Conversely, however, there will be a certain amount of guilt. There will be guilt about inequality. There will be guilt about rich and poor. There will be guilt about the, the impact of the coronavirus on particularly on the disadvantaged populations, both in the first world and in the third world. Of course, Greed will always be guilt, but guilt will be there. And then, of course, there's demography. Demography is important and it's going to drive the global economy because it's going to drive migration. People in the south are going to look at the people in the north and they're going to say, you're a lot richer than I am. I'm going to have some of that. And they're going to move. And the people who are going to move are young males who will move from Africa into southern Europe and from southern Europe into the rest of Europe, young males and women from Central America who will continue to pour into the United States. So a combination of nationalism, greed, guilt, and demographics. 
I think that's going to drive the global economy over the next decade. So uh, anyone would like to add some thoughts? I'll come back very quickly on Andrew because um, I also read the question carefully. And um, as I said, it is invention and innovation which are the two driving forces for economic growth. Technology is one of those uh, areas uh, of invention. I think your concern about trading as well is something that uh, I would just consider to be um, sophisticated gambling. And I do like that to be controlled because at the end of the day, I do like people to be consuming goods and services rather than having funds, uh, fun uh, risking uh, their money on the toss of a coin. Note that I didn't say that trading was the driving force. I said that greed was the driving force. It is manifested in trading, and I'm not going to disagree with you. Trading is gambling. It's a more sophisticated form, but it's gambling nonetheless. It is largely unproductive. There is a great deal in the financial services sector that is fundamentally unproductive, fundamentally actually some of it negative. And I say that from a conservative point of view. Uh, but it's greed that drives capitalism and capitalism is not going to go away. Do you want to come in now? Oh, I, I think I, I don't disagree with anything that's been said. I think we're saying different ways. But I think to pick up a point John has mentioned and Andrew's mentioned about technology and investment. One of the things that I see in the economy is it's not so much that we have technology and perhaps the word innovation, it's whether they get to be applied and what motivates them is it was greed often, you know, somebody figuring out a way to apply them and what the incentives are. And I think one of the challenges we have today in the world economy is um, highly consolidated industries in many ways that don't have the incentives to apply a lot of the newest technology to make technological leaps. And I think that's another interesting consideration for growth when we have a, an ever reduced number of larger corporations controlling um, different aspects of the economy. And I think that's a burden. Uh, so it comes back to what John was saying, you know, in a way that uh, that's a burden because those very large businesses end up getting closer to governments and reducing, you know, the factors that would help break them up or create competition. So yes, it, there are, um, I think, our raw capitalism that we'd like to have. There's a lot more that's kind of at work today slowing it down than there was. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to the next question. Uh, what do you think will be the profile of economic recovery in the UK over the next few years? Uh, so I'll start uh, with John. Thank you. But I take the profile here to sort of mean the shape of recovery in the UK economy. So all these V's and, uh, and U's uh, are, are talked about. And certainly um, now, if we continue with the recovery, it looks like the beginning of a V, if you like, a fairly quick recovery, but I don't think that would go very far. And it will tend to even out uh, and become a, a sort of elongated U or a W or something uh, a little bit up and down rather than uh, uh, a good recovery. And you'll see on my bio that I have been influenced over the years by Chicago. And, and the Austrians. So I must explain what I think will happen over the next two years so that it will be on record and people can look back and go, yes, he was terribly wrong, wasn't he? Um, but uh, it, it's here because from my point of view, the thing to understand is monetary demand in the economy. And monetary demand has those two components in it. It's the stock of money that's out there and it's the speed we pass it on from person to person at stock and velocity. Now it's quite clear that the money stock is going up quite rapidly with what the Bank of England has done on quantitative easing and what the government has announced in terms of its uh, increased spending. So that means money stock is rising, but the lockdown has meant velocity is slowing because people were not passing on money as quickly to each other during that period of time. So you've got at the moment, in terms of monetary demand to opposing forces, uh, one which is uh, growing stock, the other is slowing velocity. 
Now, what that means to me over the next six months or so is very low inflation, possibly a little deflation uh, for, for the odd month here or there. Not sure about the next six months, but next year, quite certain you're looking into accelerating inflation next year and you're looking at the beginning of what might become a 70s stagflation period of time. So uh, what I think will happen next year is that as inflation picks up, of course, then all the excuses will start to arise as to why this inflation is picking up. As far as I'm concerned, it's what we've done now which will cause next year's inflation. But next year, the observation will be that we have a problem with inflation and it's of a cost push nature. It's a little bit of the Phillips curves straightening. It's a little bit of profiteering. It's uh, import prices on the rise. Uh, so government will be criticized, but not. we won't look back 12 to 18 months and say, it's what we did last year that's the problem. We'll be looking at it in the, the current term and what I worry about then is that we will end up with government saying things are not going well, we need even more of the same. So we may then end up again with further overspending, uh, further uh, negative interest rates and uh, more uh, monetary expansion, which makes our problem worse, it won't go away under those circumstances. That's my view. Okay, Andrew, over to you. Well, I don't disagree with a word that John has said. I think that that probably is the, uh, the, the medium term outlook and we probably will screw it up. Uh, but let me go back a little bit to the, the, the short term. Um, it's quite clear. I mean, I think that uh, there are advocates of a, a V-shaped recovery. Andy Haldane at the Bank of England, Larry Kudlow in the United States. But... There are also many people, and I think probably the consensus in the economics community, that does not expect that. Obviously, if you have a very, very deep well and you drop a ball down it, it will bounce. And the economy has bounced precisely because it hit pretty much hit rock bottom a couple of months ago. But we're already seeing a slowdown. I mean, this is really important, real-time economic indicators, res restaurant reservations, travel, uh, payments, pick card payments, are starting to show that the recovery probably peaked in the second half, uh, well, the beginning of July, and we are already seeing a pause. Why? This is absolutely rational. Um, the out economic outlook is extraordinarily uncertain. There are 900,000 people on furlough in this country. There are many hundreds of thousands of people who will lose their jobs. When furlough ends, there will be there are companies that are going to be evicted within three, three weeks because the, it will then become possible for the first time in, in, in four months to evict people who don't pay their rent. There are many, many problems coming down the line. So the last thing that consumers are going to do is reach into their pockets to buy a shiny new car or even a, a, a washing machine. The last thing that many companies are going to do when they can't meet the rent is make big new capital investments. And of course, there are many companies, big, big companies like Jaguar Land Rover which must look at the future with enormous concern whether they're going to survive or not is a toss up. So I would assume that the recovery is going to abort fairly sharp, sharply and we are going to in the third quarter, perhaps the fourth quarter, we're going to see very tough times ahead. Over the next couple of years, what, what's going to happen? Well, I think John is absolutely right. There's no uh, appetite for austerity. Um, the OBR, the Office of Budget Responsibility, suggested that we had to raise taxes because of the enormous debt that we have taken on. Shock horror, nobody is interested in raising taxes at the present time. They're gonna keep pumping money into the economy because that's what politicians do. Down the line, I think John is right, there is going to be a price to pay for that. In the short term, it's artificial. It's gonna keep the economy bubbling up. Uh, there will be bubbles in certain markets, as, they, as we know, these will be financial markets, and the winners will be those who play in financial markets. That's the way it goes. But I don't see a happy outcome because this is really a once in a generation, perhaps once in a lifetime 
uh, event and we really don't quite know how to get out of the mess that we've got ourselves into. Well, Pete, you have the same. <laughs> well, I'll come back to, a little bit to my sort of idea that this the sea, kind of in where you are on the, on the sea is, is important. So if we looked at, again, those, you know, one of the big questions is, you know, looking at the stock market and it's pretty frequent question about valuation. Well, if you're, you know, a manufacturer, an old style manufacturer, um, certain goods, well, what's your value? What's demand going to be? Do you have a product? But if you're one of the, the technology companies that's making this phone call possible, right? You're doing really, really well, right? And so <clears throat> the value of new technology is increasing. I think we still don't understand how to value it very much, but it is certainly a major part of the stock market these days. And those people who are integrated into a more digital economy will see well how. So let's go back to some of the basics, which I think is where most people are employed. And that's what the you know, sort of the bottom of my sea in a way, and it becomes uh, some real questions. Um, one of the biggest areas, of course, for employment is you know, physical on-site retailing. You know, you could even look at bank branches as a massive number of people who used to work there, it's decreasing. And so if we come back, some of these questions John raised before Andrew about asset values, interest rates, while well, underlying a lot of this is how do we value commercial real estate, which is a major investment area and a major valuation of the country. Uh, and it's going to be different, right? The, the demands are going to be you know, very, very different. We do certain things online. Do we want to travel? You know, how do we think about central city offices? Will they be used in the same way? I don't have you know, the answers. If you're a real estate owner today, you're probably holding out for things to come back. Uh, if you're a real estate user, you're probably saying, I, I think I'll try and wait and see, you know, how it plays out. So, you know, that's a, a very fundamental part. It's, you know, it's a huge more commercial mortgage market, all these things. So I think that uh, tells much of a story. Um, I think, you know, again, as was alluded to, a lot of uh, businesses will, will fail. Uh, unemployment. But then again, if the price of real estate for commercial purposes declines, it makes it a lot cheaper to start a new business. And, and actually, it lowers the major cost of doing business. So does that help? It start? I think when you, if, if you wanted to be specific about the UK, though, one thing that has been a growing problem is we're John and Andrew could correct me, but we're relatively a low wage economy. We've got a lot of people who are on relatively low wages and those, not all of those jobs, if you work for the, the NHS or you work for government, in some of those areas, you'll, you're okay at the moment. But um, a lot of those private sector jobs are really at risk. And at the end, uh, if we talked about the future of the country, uh, one of the things is upskilling more and more people across the way and you know what libf does but a lot more across the economy is adding value to our own you know youth and productive resources our people in a digitized economy and i i don't see the government changes its educational policy just so often and it, it just um, that's the, the part that's going to help us. And if that doesn't happen, I think we're in trouble. So we either improve our resources and we're not going to have the innovation, the tech, you know, the use of technology. It'll be there, but we won't know how to use it. We want to have people who use it. So in the end, if the government gets its act together and figures out how to get education right, um, we'll have a much better long-term economy. Okay. Any further thoughts? Yeah, can I come back on one thing? Because I feel that um, one of the things that has gone really wrong in the coronavirus is the prioritization of the public sector over the private sector. Um, what 850,000 public sector workers got a raise last week. These are the people who have security of tenure. These are the people, many of them have still have final salary pensions, the value of which at a time when interest rates are zero is pretty much infinite. And yet they are the ones who got the raise. The people who lack 
uh, any kind of tenure. The people in the hospitality sector, in the leisure center, in the automobile sector, in the commercial real estate sector, who have been screwed over royally must be beating their heads against the wall. The lesson is, of course, it used to be Noel Coward would say, don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. Now the sensible parent would say, don't let your son or daughter set up a little internet company, get into the civil service. That's precisely, in my opinion, the wrong message to be sending to youth in this country going forward. But it's the rational, the rational less message that people will give to their, their children simply because the public sector has been so advantaged over the private sector throughout the coronavirus. Okay, Eddie, John, you want to add something? I agree wholeheartedly with both Andrew and Peter here because um, we do support the public sector uh, and we have missed opportunities. I think just talking to the National Health Service, there's a sort of few things going on which suggest you've got a rise, but when you take the inflation into account, it doesn't look like much of a rise. Uh, but paramedics and other people are, are receiving nothing. Uh, it's not sort of right the way across the sector. So there's going to be an attempt, I think, to hold back the private sector and support the public sector. And, and both of you mentioned, and quite right, it is the real elephant in the room, if you like. That's unemployment. What will happen to unemployment over the next year or two? In the past, economists have always had a solution to unemployment. It's to expand uh, fiscal policy and support it with an expanding monetary policy. But we've had an expanding fiscal policy and we've supported it with an expanding monetary policy and we're still going to have this unemployment. And that's where I sort of bring us back to this stagflation where you're going to get inflation accelerating, but no improvement in employment. If anything, it will distort marketplaces and make the unemployment worse. And that's where I don't see an easy solution, uh, therefore I see a big problem that we need to be prepared for. Can I, can I just add one more, which is, you know, I, I go from one day discussion with somebody talking about low interest rates, are we going to have negative interest rates, is, you know, this amount. And then, you know, to demonstrate this great uncertainty, two days later you get a conversation where, you know, gold is spiking, uh, it has the the guilt auction, is it likely to fail or not fail? Uh, there are even discussions about sterling as a reserve currency, which I think has declined for a long, long time and is probably cont gonna continue to decline. And one of those points of, is the uncertainty of whether we go with you know, virtually negative rates or rates that have to be high enough to attract investors to own sterling, just demonstrates the vast uncertainty at this point. And, I think it's, that's not the right, you, you know, looking at an economy, you want to plot out where you are. And those two directions are so far apart that it makes it even more difficult to judge. So one, one more thing about that. I think that with all um, countries more or less following the same solutions out of uh, the pandemic, which is more spending and uh, more money creation, it won't have a particularly damaging effect on the exchange rate because all countries, if you like, are making the same mistakes. So they'll look at their exchange rates and they'll go, yes, well, not much has changed on the exchange rate. And really the problems will be domestic. The problems will be the unemployment problems. The problems will be inflation. Uh, and the exchange rate may not actually identify those problems as it has done in the past. Okay, so moving on to the next question. Has she bitten off more than he can chew? And uh, Andrew, over to you. Well, this was my question. Um, and it really prompt, was prompted by this belief, and I suppose perhaps that I'm, I'm looking at things more globally and less in a national uh, UK, from a UK perspective, that um, China is the future. China is obviously the largest country in the world. It has the second largest economy. It has the fastest growth rate prior to the, uh, the, the, uh, the coronavirus epidemic. It was growing at six, seven percent a year. In the last quarter, it was actually its economy was actually up 3.2 percent year on year. The first major country that actually showed positive growth, and it is the dominant force in Asia. Um, and that's kind of the consensus. Graham Allison wrote a book a couple of years ago 
um, and subtitled the Thucydides Trap, when is the China is the rising power uh, and the United States is the status quo power, and this always ends badly for the status quo power. Um, is that really the case? Uh, it certainly is the case, um, has been the case for, for, for in, many, in many situations similar to this throughout history, but there is an alternative view. The alternative view is that First of all, China's economy is far, far too dependent on exports. They account for about 20% of GDP, far higher than in the US, where the US trade counts for about 4% of GDP. And that makes China vulnerable to the kind of pressures that the United States is, um, is putting on the Chinese at the present time. Uh, it also makes, it, makes China vulnerable to the interdiction of its exports by a much smaller force of American ships should it ever come to a, a shooting war. The second thing is that we tend probably to overestimate the power that Xi Jinping has. He is president for life. I mean, he's there like Putin is there in, 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 in Russia, and he has rejigged the rules so that he, uh, he has no effective domestic challenger. But in 2022, there is a party Congress. And within the party, this is enormously important. And the Americans can do certain things. They can, uh, they can block the sending of little princelings to Harvard. Princelings like to go to Harvard and senior figures within the Communist Party send their children to Harvard and Yale. And if they can't get into Harvard and Yale, to Penn. But that can be stopped. And the resentments within the party can really pose a threat to Xi Jinping. And of course, he has picked fights with absolutely everyone. He's picked fights with the United States and, of course, with the UK over Hong Kong. But he's picked fights with Australia, Vietnam, Thailand, the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, all, and, of course, India, all of which is a constraint on his personal power and it makes life difficult for those around him. So I'm just wondering, I'm asking this question rather than answering it. Has he bitten off more than he can chew? And is there the beginnings of internal dissent within the Communist Party that will actually lead at some stage within the next two or three years, either to his overthrow or to a sharp reining in of the power that we think at the present time is more or less absolute? It's a question. Okay, Pete, do you have an answer? Well, I'm certainly not, uh, don't claim any expertise on internal um, Chinese issues. So I, what I, I like to think of myself as focused on the banking industry. And I think the banking industry in China shows a lot about China and the world in various ways. There are, they're very large banks. They're by some measures, the world's largest banks. But in many ways, you wouldn't actually call them very sophisticated banks. And that sort of has a very interesting concept to it because uh, I've had some calls today about, you know, people wanted to discuss HSBC's results that were out and uh, this and that. And it's, a, it's quite interesting because if I were a Chinese company looking for international financial expertise, would I find it at one of these giant world's biggest Chinese banks? Or would I be likely to find more of it at HSBC. My guess is it would be HSBC. And so you have a country that, you know, growing economy, but its financial system has a lot of quirks, a lot of unsophistication left in it. It's not very sophisticated internationally at all, um, which if you have a, a, an economy that has to expand multinationally, exporting, all these things like that, it's quite they can provide money, but can they provide the correct advice and timing? So as I think Andrew sees, you know, inconsistencies, those inconsistencies in finance are certainly ever more visible to me. So I, I wonder about, you know, the, the Chinese story. It's been an incredible story over the last 30 years without any, any doubt. That's not, but it's, you know, has it hit its maturity? Because it, it seems like there are certain cracks starting and the other aspects of it that are quite interesting to look at is some of the, the, the one nation policy and uh, the Belt and Road policies. And, this. and 
it was a great expansionary issue around Asia, Africa to build relationships. And, but some of it seems to be starting to crack now. Uh, many countries have defaulted on big infrastructure project loans that they have. What does China do? How do they manage these things? So again, uh, having a less sophisticated financial services industry will make all those things more difficult. So I think China externally um, may need to, I don't know what the right word is, but perhaps step back and consolidate and think about what it's doing in a, and figure out how to improve its situation, which is declining or deteriorating. Okay. So, John. Yes, I think we're all going to come to the same conclusion here, but uh, let's go through it uh, to, to that conclusion. It's very difficult to, to manage uh, an economy from the centre, even with just a few million people in it. Uh, uh, Singapore did it quite well, but uh, when you've got 1.4 billion people, it's actually unbelievably difficult to manage this from the centre. I was in uh, China and Russia in the 90s uh, last century, um, when they were both becoming capitalists, that is, they were both freeing private property rights and encouraging people to go out and, uh, and make money. Uh, and one went democratic and the other didn't. The other stayed a, a central uh, command economy. And it was fairly obvious that China was going to grow much more rapidly uh, than, than Russia, purely because it wasn't going to go democratic. And the best illustration for me, I went to... Uh, the three gorges before they were flooded uh, and then three four years later I went back when they had been flooded. Um, can you imagine trying to flood three gorges, displace millions of people in a democratic economy? It would have taken 20 or 30 years of committees, meetings and, and ups, and, whereas they could do it straight away. It's just a case of this is what we're going to do and we did it. And China was really quite a less developed country and it matured or, or it moved towards maturity fairly quickly with high growth rates that are really instructing people we're going to do this we're going to do this and very much leading them uh, through capitalism uh, without any um, political uh, freedom and in fact one of the Chinese people I spoke to at that time said to me I couldn't care less what isn't I lived under as long as I get better off next year and the year after. And that was, uh, you know, to me, the sort of driving forces. But there is within China at the moment a ticking time bomb, and Andrew sort of hinted at this, and that is their current account surplus on their balance of payments, their reliance on export, which has drawn in lots of uh, foreign exchange into uh, China. And that foreign exchange is managed really by the Communist Party. And um, one of the things that they've decided to do is I hate to say, buy political favour around the world by projects here, projects there. I've been in Africa where all the projects are Chinese, uh, in Europe, um, in Asia. Uh, so what they're doing essentially is keeping the standard of living of their own people lower than it should be uh, if they were importing sufficient amounts to equal the value of their exports. Uh, but the, the Communist Party at the centre is uh, quite powerful, if you like, in having the money to spend for all us countries with large current account uh, deficits on the balance of payments. So I think that's, that will come back to, to bite, um, using a similar analogy to Chu, um, President uh, uh, Xi, because again, go back almost to the first thing I said about governments spend money wastefully. But when you've got loads of it to spend, you can spend uh, and help growth, but you also waste as well. And there are lots of examples around China of money being wasted, of towns being built and, and not occupied. Um, it's a tremendous misallocation of resources that is taking place and is very much hidden, I think, within the things that we talk about. And when you look at the political context of uh, the battles that they're trying to fight and the people who are not um, uh, now going to be their best friends, I do see uh, considerable problems in the future. Uh, Hong Kong has sort of illustrated uh, uh, what will happen to people if they start to question things. And I think as problems develop, people will 
question it more and the regime will become more repressive in trying to quell people who are asking questions and, uh, and wanting uh, to debate issues and I think that will be sooner or later the downfall of China. Right, so anyone would like to add? Yeah, can I just uh, agree with what everyone is saying, but just add another little concern, and that is that when this pressure does build on Xi, what does he do? Does he step down? Does he uh, impose domestic repression? Or does he look abroad for cheap wins? And it has been my conviction for a very long time that he will be tempted to, having absorbed Hong Kong, he will be tempted to do something against Taiwan not, I think, against the main island of Taiwan, but I just bring to your memory the, the Kuimoi and Matsu problems of the 1950s. Kuimoi is now called Kinmen, but the Matsu Islands are still there. They are just off the coast of mainland China. They are filled with uh, gambling casinos where both mainland Chinese and Taiwanese waste their money, but the Chinese mainland could take them in an afternoon. And what would the Americans do then? It would be a cheap, easy win for an increasingly nationalistic China. Anyone else? Okay, so moving on to my last question. Which will be the world's largest economy in five years time? And I'll start with Pete. Well, by, by all rights, it, it, it should be. China, you know, that's uh, with the number of people as, you know, four or five to five times what the U.S. population is, you know, it's a question. I mean, somebody might in their dreams say that India would come alive and take over. I think uh, they may become more populous, but I don't know if they'll be, they don't have economic power like that. But China, yes, it, it can. Um, some of those political things we've just talked about raise those questions. And, you know, the other, you know, five years, it's always difficult to call a time, but uh, we come back to a little bit of where we started and it's about, you know, demographics. And so, you know, one of the issues in China is the, the social systems, as I understand it, that um, old age is not really a, a funded state. Um, act, you know, the state is not funding pensions, health care, etc. Uh, when a lot of those people who have made China over the last 30 years find their resources diminishing, all these things, what, what, what demands, again, um, going back to Andrew's comments, does the government decide to, you know, how does it placate maybe the, that uh, unhappy population? in some ways through medical care or other um, social spending. So, you know, how can they keep the, uh, the miracle, you know, growing? Seems ever more doubtful from the one, you know, certain basic economics and the other is, you know, demographic trends. So that's, you know, where I'd, I'd like, if I had another way to cheat on the question though, um, and then I cheat a lot on questions. I guess say I learned how to pass exams. Uh, you might say that Europe, uh, as opposed to a country, but the, but the EU. And it depends, you know, again, you know, you're asking lots of questions. How does the EU deal with, you know, the current crisis? Uh, how does it deal with, uh, is it closed? Is it open? Is it immigration? But um, how the, if you will, those sort of the delinquent states in the East, uh, if they can bring them, them sort of politically back into line in some cases. So is there promise uh, in, in Europe? Uh, through the 30 years I've lived in Europe, I, I've always found it interesting. I've found how um, when push comes to shove at the end, uh, Europe manages to muddle through. So... Uh, maybe, maybe there is a future for Europe, but right now it looks like, like China should be the logical winner. Again, more people are being more productive. Okay, so Andrew. Well, I, I was going to, I was going to uh, say that in the short term and the five years is I think the short term, it 
it has to be China, but that's not terribly interesting. What is more interesting is what Pete has just said. Will Europe develop a national identity? Will the, the answer to every problem that's ever come up when it comes to the EU has been more Europe. Uh, and my rabidly pro-European friends are starting to believe that they think as Europeans rather than Maria as Portuguese or my Greek friends as Greeks. I mean, I think this is total nonsense. I'm half Polish and I notice that the Poles are extremely nationalistic. The Slovaks are extremely nationalistic. The Hungarians are extremely nationalistic and God only knows about the Czechs and so on and so forth. But there is a myth that there will develop within five to ten years maybe a European nationality I and mean, I assume it will speak Esperanto. Um, so that's the, the, the sensible answer. The, the off the wall answer is California. Um, I'm not at all convinced that given all the stresses that the United States is going through at the present time, it can hold together in the long term. It's clearly going to hold together in the next five years. It'll almost certainly hold together in the next 20 years. But going much beyond that, it's going to be a bilingual country. There are, it's going to be a country in which Hispanics dominate the South, the Southwest, and probably the West. It's going to be a country in which I don't think any of the racial problems will be resolved, and it could fragment. And I think that's really interesting. Let's talk about some of the things that nobody is really prepared to talk about at the present time. And that is whether the United States of America will continue to be united or will become the disunited States of America. Okay, John. Yeah, I don't, um, well, yeah, I will have to redefine biggest in a moment, but uh, America has real problems, I think, because, uh, you had a Democratic Party that wanted to uh, spend loads of money and uh, uh, do uh, lots of uh, stimuli that Trump disagreed with and then came to power and did exactly that, spent loads of money and uh, did as much stimulus as the Democrats would have done. You look in um, our country, uh, exactly the same sort of thing. Uh, you know, Boris would have done a really good job for Corbyn in terms of his overspending and all the things that have gone on in the UK. China already identified problems um, that uh, are going to exist there. India is interesting because India could sneak through this uh, and come out of this uh, quite well. But in terms of biggest, um, I hope because it's democratic that uh, America might see sense uh, and might start to think about doing those things that uh, reactivate its economy and get things going and I think China will have difficulty changing uh, I think they've gone down one particular route uh, and it will be difficult for them to get out of it but I would actually like to look um, uh, and think of big in terms of perhaps highest per capita income and I think it's those countries that are not so big but out of uh, everything that might well come uh, through this quite well so I would go probably for some of the European countries who are not in the EU um, and think of the Switzerlands and some of the, uh, the Nordic countries uh, and for Asia thinking of uh, uh, South Korea, of Vietnam um, and uh, places in South America, Chile seems to be getting itself, getting its act together. So I think it would be quite interesting if we sort of rephrase this question and thought about the countries that might uh, find their standard of living, their per capita incomes growing the most over the, the next uh, uh, 10 years. And certainly I think the big units won't. America won't be growing. China won't be growing as fast as it has been as it reaches a more mature state. Uh, and uh, as, as you know, I, I don't think the EU will hold it together uh, either. So it, to me, it's, it's a sort of interesting thing to look at smaller countries. So if I have to, to leave the UK, uh, then I should be looking at these countries to, to relocate, not, not to China uh, or to America. Okay. A any other further thoughts? Okay, so this is it. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank you all for your contributions, for your thoughts today. You've been thank absolutely you. fantastic. 
So we have three economists and 10 different uh, opinions, of course. <laughs> uh, at least. Thank you. So thank you so much. So thanks, Pete. Thanks, John. Yes. Thanks, Andrew. Yes. Uh, bye bye. Thanks, Stay well. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. bye.